Well, good morning. Welcome to worship service, Mount Gilead Baptist Church. So good to see all of you here. I pray that you are prepared to worship. We've got a wonderful worship service for you today. But look, we can plan worship. But we cannot worship unless the Spirit of God moves amongst His people. So my prayer is, is that right now at this time as we have a, a call to worship, the point of the call to worship is for the people of God to prepare their hearts to worship, to be in tune with God, to be thoughtful about the Word, to be thoughtful about where your hearts are, be thoughtful about where your minds are and what you're focused upon. So my, my my heart is today as we begin worship is that our, our heart and our focus goes to the Lord. Now, Brother Mike uh, normally does announcements and gets us started, but he is back in the back helping with a nursery. We have uh, uh, so many of our people out with the uh, back-to-school retreat that the youth are, are on, so that's where a lot, of, a lot of them are and a lot of parents that are involved in that. And so you got me for announcements, and so this is what we're going to do for announcements. How many of you have one of these? Hold it up. How many of you can read? Hold your other hand up. Look, a bunch of Pentecostals in this place. How about that? I... But you can. Now, I want to tell you, if there's one thing Brother Mike complains about more than anything else is this. People will come up to him and go, well, we didn't know about so-and-so. And he'll say, well, I said it. And it's in the bulletin. You didn't read it. I saw all those hands up said you could read. So literally, I'm not going to go through these, but everything you need to know is in here. The only thing I will mention is tonight we have our, um, our worship tonight, our three-chord gathering. Sunday night's 5 o'clock, come be a part of that. Many of you have small groups after that. Uh, you will have time. We will be done at 5.30. Brother Mike will be preaching uh, tonight. It's his time. He's going to be preaching, I believe, in Revelation 21. I think he said 21 or 22, wherever he is in his study on that. And so it's going to be a great and wonderful time. Let's join together now in prayer as we focus upon the Lord. Gracious Father, we think deeply about you today and we sing passionately for the love of God that flows upon us and covenant and the indwelling through the spirit and through the gospel and through the work of Christ making us children of God those who were enemies those who were uh, in uh, an outcast are now drawn in and loved and so, Father, I pray now that we would be able to put the world aside, put all of the, the trials of this day that to come along with uh, what we're, uh, the world that we live in, and that our hearts would be in tune with you. And Lord, the truth is, to be able to function in the world, we need this time with you together as the body of Christ, to be able to make a difference in the world as we are sent out to spread the gospel throughout all homes and all nations. We need this time together. So, Father, I pray that your spirit would come and move and that our hearts would worship you in spirit and in truth and that you would be pleased and our hearts would be full because of your word, because of the choirs they sing, because of the hymns that we sing, because of your presence with us. We worship you now. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. If you senior adults especially, if you look 55 and above, there's an insert there that says uh, Young at Heart Trip. We had planned and thought uh, very seriously about going to Branson, but the, uh, the expense was just a little too great of what we, we thought it might be. And so we have planned next month uh, to go to, uh, to the Pigeon Forge, Gatlinburg area. So if you'll see that, get that in quickly if you decide to do that so I can go ahead and finish the reservations, okay? Well, I appreciate uh, Brother Bradley and Brother Josh uh, giving me the joy and the privilege to stand here again before you. Will we stand and together and uh, look at your neighbor and say, I like the way you're going to sing today.
Would you sing Psalms 42 with me, would you? As the deer panted for the water, so my soul longed after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You alone are my strength, my
people say amen, please? Thank you, Father. You may be seated, congregation. Our entire service this morning has been built around Psalm 42. The worship songs that we've just sung, the hymns centered around those themes, the choir's about to sing a, a very thoughtful song centered around Psalm 42 entitled, Lord from Sorrow's Deep I Call. I'm going to preach this psalm in just a moment, but I would like for us to read it now. I will read it as we start at verse 1 and and read all the verses. There are 11 verses and following we're going to hear our choir lead us. And I want you to be thoughtful of the truth of the psalm as you hear its truth in their voices. Psalm 42. It says, to the choir master, a mascal of the sons of Korah, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? <clears throat> my tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? <clears throat> These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God. With glad shouts and songs of praise. A multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hoping God. For I shall, I shall again praise him, my salvation, my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you. From the land of of Jordan and of Ermon and from Mount Mazar, deep calls to deep. At the roar of your waterfalls, all your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands a steadfast love. And it Night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? As with a deadly, as with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me. While they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God.
Should my life be torn from me, every worldly pleasure, when all I possess is greed, God be then my treasure. Amen. What a thoughtful song and a, uh, as we were going to see, a gut-riching psalm. As we continue in worship, we worship through giving, giving of tithes and offering, giving of our hearts, giving of our attention and something of our lives to Him as we're able to give back a bit of what He has given to us. Uh, I did mention uh, during the opening, I should have, uh, that uh, we've got a number of guests with us today. We're incredibly thankful to have you with us. Uh, as the offering plates go around, we don't ask you to give anything. Our church members will take care of that. But we do ask you, if you would, to take the uh, guest card that's in the pew in front of you. Fill that out right fast. Drop it in the offering plate. We'll be able to connect more meaningfully with you as we worship together. Uh, join me in prayer as we seek the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for your presence with us. Thank you that even in the dark sorrow of the night, when we can't feel you, you are there. And Father, even as we give back now, we realize that all that we have, every breath, every heartbeat, every ounce of financial blessing, every part of who we are, every moment of life is a gift from you. So Father, we give it back and we ask for you to give your blessing over our gifts today that it might go forward with the gospel blessing on it, with the Holy Spirit using it to, to make a difference in our communities, in our homes, but also throughout our world. We pray all those things in Christ's name. Amen.
Amén. We've read our text this morning already, so I would like to start, however, with, uh, with us together in prayer. We're in Psalm 42, as I already mentioned, so if you have your scriptures and you haven't opened there yet, I invite you to take your copy of God's Word open to Psalm, Psalm 42. We're going to dive into the entirety of this passage. As we begin, would you join me in prayer? Gracious fathers, we come today to a, a difficult psalm, a difficult reality of what it means to live as a Christian. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would comfort us through this psalm, but also speak powerfully about the realities of who you are, regardless of what we may feel in the moment. Lord, I pray that I might preach in a way that truly reflects what the psalmist is saying. Holy Spirit, Lord, would you take this word and would you apply it as ointment to the hearts of your people. We meet you now in your word. Let's pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I know I don't look like it now, but in another lifetime, <clears throat> I was a runner. A runner of long distance races. I've run few half marathons. I've run two full marathons. <clears throat> Any runners out there? Anybody that has run a marathon before? Anybody's done that? Just me. I know. There we go. We've we got a few out there. Vanessa's run, run one, uh, or probably a few. Uh, it's a long way. A marathon is 26.2 miles to run. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a long way to drive. But we used to run those races, and what unique about those races is that you actually have to carry sustenance with you because it's too far to run with, with just going on the McDonald's that you had that morning. You bring like goo packs with you, and they have uh, stations along the way that, that gives you water and Gatorade and Powerade and, and those kind of things. And when you get done with that kind of race, I want to tell you, you will never be more thirsty than you are after you finish that kind of race. I mean, it's not uncommon when you finish a marathon for uh, you to, to just find everything you can to drink and pour it down, or even for uh, there to be stations to give you an IV to rehydrate you. You are so thirsty after running that hard for that long. Now the reason I mention that to you is because of the metaphor that the psalmist begins with in Psalm 42. He compares the thirst for God's presence to the thirst of a deer running and panting for water. He says in verse 1, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. Now the temptation as we read that is to think about how good God is to quench the soul of those who are thirsty for Him. That that's what this is about. But that's not at all what this passage is about. The deer in this psalm is not panting because he has water. I want you to point something out. The deer in this psalm is panting and thirsting because he does not have water. Of all the psalms that we've dealt with over this summer, this, uh, and I hope you've enjoyed this series, the summer in the psalms. I've enjoyed it. We'll, we'll probably do it again next year. It's been really good. But in all the psalms that I've dealt with, this has by far been the most challenging to deal with. By far the most difficult to, to, to deal with the truth of what he's talking about and to understand it and deal with it in my own soul. Because this psalm is not about how God quenches the soul of those who are thirsty for him. But it's about longing. It's about the person who is longing for God, God's presence to be in their life and yet feel like God is completely absent. It's about a person longing to hear from God, and yet God being completely silent. Note what he says in verse 2. He says, When shall I come and appear before God? 
We see the problem of the psalmist here now. It's, it's that the psalmist was most likely a Levite who was used to worshiping in the temple in Jerusalem. But for whatever reason, he's now been exiled out of Jerusalem uh, into a land surrounded most likely by Gentiles. We're going to see enemies that speak to him, that ask him, where is your God? And now he can't go into the temple. He, he can't go and be with his people in Jerusalem worshiping the king. And if you know something about uh, that Jewish worldview and, and that uh, the, the presence of God in the Old Testament was centered around the Ark of the Covenant. It was centered around the Holy of Holies in the temple. So for a Jew not to be able to go into Jerusalem and not to be in the temple, it was to be absent of the presence of God. And it's that absence of God's presence that is haunting him. Haunting him in this psalm. Haunting his soul. The absence of God. Every Christian at some time knows what it's like. To long for God, to long to be in his presence, but to feel like God is somewhere else. It reminds me of something even Jesus said as he was dying on the cross for our sin. As he cried out, it says in, in Psalm, excuse me, Matthew 27, 46. At about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever felt forsaken by God? Maybe it was because of something in your life didn't go the way you thought certainly God would have it go. You didn't get in that college that you wanted to get into or uh, you, you felt rejected by someone that was really important to you. Maybe it was some type of financial struggle because of a failure of a business or a job or something like that that you just cannot believe that God would allow this to happen. Maybe it's the death loved one over the years some here have lost children how could God let this happen how could God let this happen God I need to hear from you I felt like that as your pastor before in dealing with issues of, of the church that come up with great gravity the elders and I have sat around the table and prayed and prayed and prayed and, and cried out God we need to hear we need to know what you want. We need to know that you are with us in the midst of these trying times. And it's in those times where we tend to start quoting Scripture and tell, tell God what He has said. Now, God, you have said to us, like Psalm 139, 7 and 8, Where shall I go from your Spirit? And where shall I flee from your presence? This is what you've said, God. I can't get away from you. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. You're supposed to be here. I mean, Jesus said at the end of the Great Commission, and what? And behold, I am, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. All right, God. I know that you said that I would never be alone. But if I could be real honest, if you're with me right now, I sure can't see it. There's times of distress, the kind of distress that leaves you where you don't even have hunger for food. Where you can't eat, you can't drink, mostly what you do in the middle of the night is cry. That's where the psalmist is, verse 3, and this is what he says. My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? So this psalmist, you can see him, this Levite exiled amongst the Gentiles, not being able to experience the, the presence of God. And the Gentiles taking this, these, these enemies of God, these pagans, as a perfect opportunity to cry out to, to him, to call out to him. Hey, where's your God now? Hey, how's your faith working for you right now? And no doubt he wants to push back on that. But in reality, deep in his soul, he's kind of wondering the same thing. Where is God? I know it because he says he is in verse 9. Look at verse 9. I say to God, my rock. 
Why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? And so it's in this circumstance right now that he needs desperately to feel God's presence. And right now he feels nothing. And so I think here's something that all of us should note. That that dilemma as a Christian, longing to hear from God, needing to feel the presence of God, and yet hearing nothing from God and feeling nothing of God, is not uncommon amongst believers. But it is a common experience. One that we need to know how to wrestle with and deal with. And this psalm helps us with that. Particularly in identifying our pain and and giving us some sense of a pathway through it. So if that's where you are today, or if you find yourself there in upcoming days, months, and years, I pray you'll remember this psalm. And you'll go back to it. And it will be helpful to you. What's the psalmist's journey through this struggle? It starts, starts with remembering. Remember. He's forced to remember. What's he forced to remember? Well, first he's forced to remember the past. Look at verse 4. He says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul. These things I remember. The psalmist has good memories of being with God. Good memories of worship. Good memories of God's presence being so near to him as as he he drinks of the presence of God like the deer drinking from from flowing springs. right? And this is what he says about things he remembers in verse 4. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how, how I would go with the throng and lead them in the procession to the house of God with, great sh- with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. So he remembers as a Levite uh, taking annual pilgrimages into Jerusalem and to the temple, he remembers the power of God's presence during those great Jewish festivals and, and, and feasts worship times he remembers times of the passover he remembers the joy of the the feast of first fruits and the feast of the tabernacles he can remember times of being so close to god that's the problem of feeling far from god though because when you feel far from god you feel the distance because you know how far you are now from when you felt close to him You remember feeling those times of being close to God. I mean, so close to God that that your insides just welled up in joy. Maybe it was at a a summer camp. Maybe hopefully some of our our, our young people are experiencing that right now at the beach as they, they get away and focus on God and focus on the year. Maybe for some of you it was about it was at a revival time. Maybe it was when you got saved. Maybe it was when uh, you were going through a hard time and God met you there and you were just so close to God and it was so wonderful and you remember that. Well, the problem with that kind of mem- memory is when you feel far from God and you remember the times that you were close to God, it's hard to tell whether that memory Is beautiful medicine or whether it's just keeping the wound open and the pain of distance from God now fresh and so the psalmist struggles as we often struggle in a similar way he struggles with the past it's common to remember the past But he also struggles as he remembers the Lord. Look at verses 6 through 8 here. We'll start with verse 6. He says it very clearly. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember. Who does he remember? He says, I remember you. From the land of, of Jordan and of Ermon and from Mount Mazar. I want you to notice where the psalmist is not. The psalmist is not in Jerusalem. He's not in the temple. He's not in the presence of God. No, the cloud of God's absence has not been lifted. But now he's brought himself to the source of the Jordan River. 
which is near the Sea of Galilee. Mount Mazar is one of those peaks in the range, in the mountain range that includes Mount Ermon as well. And so now he's alone in the mountains where the, the streams that source the Jordan River flow out of the mountains uh, and, and create this river. And he, he's struggled with the past, and now he's, he's struggling with, with, with the Lord. And this, this description of this particular struggle is, is one of the most difficult things that I have dealt with in, in the last probably year or so as, as a pastor. Anything that I've studied in a long time. So verse 7, I have wrestled with for a while. Here's what he says in this struggle. Deep calls to deep. At the roar of your waterfalls, all your breakers and your ways have gone over me. What does that mean? What does that mean? Deep calls to deep. I have read everything I can find on that phrase. What does it mean for God's, God's waterfalls, that deep calls to deep with, within the waterfalls, that the roar of your waterfalls? What does it mean for God's breakers and his waves to have gone over him? Well, the psalmist is struggling deeply, of course, with the absence of God's presence, and he longs for it, and now he, he's alone and he's struggling with God. So here's, out of a lot of thought, and I've got it written down in my notes. We'll see if I can just communicate it to you. Here's what I think he's, he's saying. Here's the psalmist, and he's struggling with God. He needs to hear from God, and he just can't hear from God. And, 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 and he needs to feel God's presence, and God just doesn't feel like he's there. And so now he has gone into this, this mountain range where the roar of the, the streams coming down the mountain that feed the Jordan River, and he's sitting there. And, and, and as he sits there and as he contemplates, he hears the roar of the waters falling through the mountains. And there's something about that sound, there's something about that moment, there's something about the currents and the deep and the roar of the water that speaks to the current and the deeps of, of his own soul. And it causes him to contemplate God in a deeper way, in a profound way. Deep calls to deep. And the only way I know to maybe to describe it is, have you ever been to the beach or been to the, the mountains or like the Grand Canyon or something that was just kind of overwhelmed there? And, and, you, and you sit there and, and you look at this and there's something about that environment that speaks to your soul. There's something about God's creation that God uses that, that speaks inside your soul, that there's something deep and grand and profound in this, this environment that speaks to the, the deepness and the most profound parts of who we are. Deep calls to deep. And, 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 and we need those times. And I think one of the things that overwhelmed me as I really co contemplated about this is the fact that not enough Christians struggle with what the psalmist is struggling with. I mean, not enough Christians really are overwhelmed with grief because they don't feel God's presence in their life. And I thought, well, why is it? Why don't we struggle more with this, this issue of not being able to or this issue of, of God being distant. I mean, for most, for most Christians that I know, they come to church, they leave and that, and they don't really know if God feels distant or not. And quite frankly, they don't care. Not until something profoundly bad starts happening to them. And why is that? Well, I think as I thought about this, that it's because we live in the most distracted age that has ever walked the earth. I mean, I, you know, I, there was a day and age where uh, parents had to top, stop their children from reading because it would distract them from prayer. Here, don't. Put that book down. When's the last time you told a child to put a book down? Like, read, please, God, read. And then it was newspapers, right? They, they just kind of consumed our day. The world was going on. Magazines. And TV. 
I used to preach sermons where we talked about how many hours a, a, we, we average watch a TV a day. And today, I don't even know, I left, I leave, well, my phone's actually down there. We walk around with little computers in our pockets that give us all the information about everything you could possibly want to know at any given time about any given thing. And now, if you ask it, it'll tell you your average screen time, and it will warn you. They actually have to build into an, to, to the phones warnings about how much screen time you're using. And then I realize how much there's a need for deep to call the deep. How much there is a need for us to turn a phone off. For us to turn a TV off. For us to lay down newspapers, digital newspapers now. For us to close a book. And for us to go and find ourselves alone with God and being willing to struggle with God there. Maybe it's at the beach and you just need to go to the beach, not because you're going on vacation, but because you're going to find God. And you just put your chair in the, in, the, in the sand and you let the waves roll up to your feet until you are so profoundly thankful for who God is and God's working in your life that you can't help but cry out in joy. Or you are so profoundly sad in the depths of your soul because you realize you can't feel God. We have a need for deep to call to the depths of our souls to find out where we really are. It might not be at the beach. It might be at the mountains. It might be on your front porch where you get up 30 minutes earlier tomorrow and you just go sit in your rocking chair. We got a rocking chair out on four of them actually out on our front porch. Swing in the back. I like to get up early and listen, close my eyes and listen to the day come alive. Listening to the birds start to tweet, listening to the crickets die down and the grasshoppers start to jump, right? You know what I'm saying? I don't know what it sounds like for the earth to come alive around you. Because it's in those times that the depths of creation as it wakens begins to speak to the depths of my soul and I can hear it more clearly and that's when I try to take the word of God and open it and seek him deep calls the deep but when the psalmist says That the deep of that moment, of those waters roaring through the mountainside, you know what it reminds him of? That it's like God's waves of the water are pouring over him in such a way that he's drowning. That he can't even breathe. And he's struggling. He's struggling. He said, all your breakers and your waves have gone over me. And so here the psalmist, he longs to hear from God. He longs to feel his presence. He's gotten alone. He's the deep calls to him, and yet he still cannot. It feels like God is punishing him more than he is blessing him. What do you do in that moment? I told you this psalm was hard. He remembers, he remembers the past. It's hard. And he remembers the Lord. And he still doesn't have answers. But you know the next thing he does? Not only does he remember, but he preaches. When you get there, not only do you remember, but you preach. You preach 
Look what he says uh, as he preaches truth. He preaches truth to his own soul. He speaks to his soul. Look what he says in verse 5. He says, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you in turmoil uh, within me? Just this morning I had a conversation. We were uh, fixing some things on the PowerPoint for this morning. And I was talking to myself. And I turned and looked at Ross. And Ross said, uh, you always talk to yourself, Bradley? Uh, yeah. He said, well, do you answer yourself? The answer is yes, I do. I talk to myself, I answer myself, mostly because I'm the only one that will listen to me. <laughs> Nevertheless, this is the psalmist. And you know what the psalmist is doing to his soul? He's talking to himself. He calls himself, oh my soul. He's speaking to himself. And he's speaking truth to himself. He's preaching truth to himself. Look what he's asked. He asks his soul, why are you in turmoil within me? And then he preaches. He says to his soul, hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Let me ask you something. Who's your favorite preacher? Oh, no, don't say me. That's, don't, don't do that. That's fine. No, I mean, but who is, who is your, who's your, I mean, some might say like um, John MacArthur or, I might say like Charles Spurgeon, I, guess I read him a ton. Or, you know, you just have different preachers that you, that you really enjoy. Let me tell you who should be your favorite preacher. You. You should be your favorite preacher. You are the most influential preacher for yourself on the face of the earth. You don't listen to any other preacher more clearly and more faithfully than you listen to what you preach to yourself. The psalmist knows that, and so the psalmist determined to preach truth to himself. He preaches truth to himself, and we need to preach truth to ourselves. We need to preach to ourselves, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. I don't have to see it to believe it and know who God is is true. We preach Psalm 84, 11 to ourselves, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. We preach truth. That God loves me, that God doesn't withhold good from me, that God is there, that I am his child. We preach truth, 1 Peter 5.10. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to, to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. You have got to be your most influential preacher, and you've got to know the truth, and you've got to speak truth to your ailing heart, your faithless heart, every single day and every single moment that you struggle. Preach truth, and then persevere. And then persevere. Along with the psalmist preaching truth to his soul, notice the persistence in his faith that he will not give up. He will not give in to his enemies. Notice his psalmist had, no, the psalmist had enemies. I mentioned to you before. And they're taunting him. They're asking, where is your God? Where is your God? We had a conversation amongst the staff as we were talking about this psalm this week. And what we realized is, is there's not a lot of like real enemies like yelling at the church asking us, where is your God now? Or even yelling at, uh, I mean, I've got a few atheist friends that we go back and forth every now and then, but that's not a, a really super common experience. But then we realize something. You know who you're great, like you are your greatest preacher, you know what else you are? Your greatest enemy. Because the psalmist struggled. He asked, where is God? Now that is something that we do from time to time. Where is God? God, why aren't you? Maybe you don't exist. Maybe I'm just living a lie. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm whatever. And, and, and we can't allow that to happen. So we preach truth to ourselves. We preach truth to our souls. And we believe what we're saying to ourselves from the word. And thus we keep going. We keep believing. L listen to what he says in verse 8. In the midst of all this struggle, this is what he said. I, man, I struggle. like, how does verse 8 fit in the rest of this? I get it now. Because look what he says. He says, by day the Lord commands a steadfast love. And at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. It's like, what? What? Because nothing's really changed here. The psalmist still feels far from God. It still feels like God is absent. 
But the psalmist is preaching truth to himself, and he says, regardless of how I feel, I know who God is. I know who he is. And God is the one who commands his steadfast love over me. God is the one who protects me. God is the one who cares for me. God is the one who saves me. And therefore, I will worship him. What he, what, he, what he says here, he says, that he's, he, he says that the Lord's song is still, oh, he's day by day, um, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me. His so- In other words, he's struggling to feel God's presence, but he knows God's love, and he will sing to God's glory. Just because he doesn't feel God's presence doesn't keep him from praising. Just because he doesn't feel God's presence will not keep him from praying. He says, a prayer to the God of my life. And I think, church, that's a a, a reality we must embrace, that regardless of how we may feel in the moment, we say, I know who God is, therefore I will keep singing. I will keep praying. I will keep coming to church. I will keep giving. I will keep being engaged in small groups. I will keep glorifying God with my life. And here's ultimately why we can persevere in the midst of that. Listen to the psalmist in verse 11. He also says in verses 5 and 6, but I'll just quote in verse 11 here. He says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, and this is why. For I shall again praise him. The psalmist knows that this moment in his life, this this feeling of absence from God will not last forever. This is just a temporary moment. Something God is allowing him to go through that may even take years and decades For him to get the lesson. But he will persevere in prayer and in praise. Because he knows this is not how it ends. I shall again praise him. Remembering. What do you do when you go through these dark nights of the soul? You remember being close with God. You struggle with the Lord. You remember him. And then you preach truth. And then you persevere by faith. Hold on to that church. There's coming a night where you will need it. In a moment, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. And... Uh, if you, I'll be here if you'd like for me to pray for you. If you're going through a, a, a dark night of the soul right now, I'll be grateful, love to pray for you. Maybe you want to just do business with God. We'll make this place an altar, a place to do business with God. Maybe you wanna just want to get on your knees and pray. Maybe right now where you are, you just need to say, God, I'm, I'm listening. Maybe you need to make a commitment that, hey, I'm going to go get alone. I'm just going to listen and let the deeps call to the deeps. God is good. He has a purpose for all of our pain. And he has us a pathway out of all of our sorrows. He's a covenant God who loves his children. Though we feel alone, The reality of God's word is that we never are. Now maybe you're here and you say, well, I'm not really a believer. I've been more of the Gentiles crying, doubting faith. The hope that this psalmist has is the same hope that you have. The whole world has one hope, that Jesus Christ saves sinners. It doesn't mean life is easy. It doesn't mean that we always have all the answers. We rarely do. But it means that he's always there. And we can trust him. 
preach truth to your soul. Persist in faith. Father, Lord, as we meet you, Lord, we're honest to, to say that so often we can identify with the psalmist. And we feel like you're not with us. Lord, forgive us for that. And teach us to preach the truth of your word to our souls. And to continue in prayer and praise no matter what. For you have a purpose for the pain. You have a reason for sending us through the dark night. Father, I pray now that you will encourage your people through your word. Father, I pray for those that are lost, that by grace they can be saved this morning. Lord, I pray for our young people who are down at the beach dealing with the deep things of God and where they are in their lives. Lord, I pray that you meet them there. And for us here, Father, I pray that you would make steadfast our faith. And that our faith would not be built upon any feelings of the moment. But our faith is built upon nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And for that we glorify you. Call to us, Father. Speak to us. As we need to hear from you. We pray all these things in Christ's name. May we stand. The grace of God has reached for me. I know His grace will renew it.
people said amen the next time we preach psalm 42 somebody else has got to preach it good night that's hard but it is comforting to know that we're not the only ones that have ever struggled deeply with the abs or the feeling of the absence of god it's a common reality for the christian to feel that way but it's an uncommon reality it's a never never reality that we are ever alone. Preach truth to your soul. Thank you so very much for being here. Um, come back tonight. We're going to be worshiping again from 5 to 5.45. Brother Mike's going to be preaching. He's out of Revelation. I think again I've read Revelation 21. Uh, if you've ever read the book of Revelation, you know he's got a bear of a text to work with too. Um, so we're going to have a wonderful time. And then, of course, uh, many of you have small groups tonight. Uh, the elders, we have our, a meeting at 4 o'clock today. And uh, kind of we got some things to talk about. Um, all right, I believe Brother Gene Zeback is going to come. He's going to close us out with prayer. Brother Danny, is there anything you need to mention before we go? All right. Amen. Well, as Brother Gene comes and uh, closes us out today, I just remind us that uh, we're not dismissed, but we are sent. We do have the gospel. Let's go change the world with it. Okay, maybe we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing to be able to worship you on this beautiful day. Lord, we're blessed to have a church and a staff through which the true gospel is preached each and every Sunday. Heavenly Father, as we leave here today, you know, let us leave with a strong faith, a strong witness, and a strong desire to serve you through the words we speak and the actions we take and thank you lord we recognize and give you the credit and glory you deserve for making things all things possible lord in your holy name amen